Hi, everyone. Uh, so today we have a very special episode with Dr. Adi. Um, we're going to be interviewing him, asking him questions about his journey as an IMG and try to learn from that, from his struggles and his journey and his experiences in the USA to become a, to become a fully licensed USA doctor coming from India. So, but first, I'm going to ask for the incredible team that is here with us to introduce themselves. So why don't you go ahead first, Andrea? Hi, I am Andrea. I am a medical student in Peru, and I am currently doing a research internship at the University of Buffalo, Roswell Park at Buffalo, New York. Oh, please go next, Val. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm Vale. I am from Lima, Peru. I'm from Peru as well as Andrea. I'm a fifth year medical student, and I'm really interested in ID and neurology, so really excited to learn from uh, Dr. Adi's experience. And thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, I think I'm gonna pass the mic to Kirtan maybe so that he can introduce himself. Hello, myself, Kirtan Bertolia. So I have graduated from BJ Medical College, Ahmedabad. And you know, I'm so excited for today's session because we know that Dr. Aditya is famous for his role in antibiotic stewardship and how he has passion for this ID. So I'm so excited to learn that how he has progressed over the years and how we can derive the lessons from him. So thank you so much for joining us. Uh, next would be Lara. Hello, everyone. I'm Lara. I'm a third year medical student from Brazil, and I'm super excited for today's session. Um, the team prepared a really, really nice questions. And thank you, uh, Dr. Eddie, for being here. And yeah, let's do it. And least but not the least, our president, Charmaine. Oh, I thought I will be just being the background, but hi everyone, I'm Charmaine. I'm just here to support this incredible team and thank you, Adi, for being here. I can't wait to learn from all of your wisdom. Um, so first, I'm gonna introduce Dr. Adi. Dr. Adi attended medical school in Mumbai, Idiom. He's currently an assistant professor in medicine at the Mayo Clinic. His research and career interests included antimicrobial stewardship and diagnostic stewardship, particularly in critical ill populations. In his free time, Dr. Adi enjoys baseball, soccer, and cricket. He believes in fitness and making health life choices. He confesses he will travel for food and experiences, and he strongly believes that humor is the best way to make an important point. So thank you, Dr. Ari, for joining us. Yeah, thank you for having me. As I was telling you, Rafael, before, I thought this was going to be like recorded and uploaded. And I see so many people logging in and mm -hmm. uh, I'm not going to lie. This is a bit ner nerve wracking or anxiety inducing, but I will try my best to um, give you guys some tips on my journey. Oh, thank you, thank you. Um, so first, I'm uh, gonna start um, with the first question then. Um, so Dr. Adi, why did you decide to come to the United States? Sure, so that's a, that's a very deep question. So I started medical school back in India in 2006, 15 years back, I feel super old. But yeah, I started medical school in 2006. Up until the fourth or fifth year of my medical school, I never wanted to come to the US. I wanted to, um, do internal medicine in India. However, some of my, uh, so backstory to that was I did not get into my first choice medical school in my home city. So I had to go to a medical school, which was outside and several miles away from my home city. However, and I was miserable in my first two years in medical school, very stressed out, missing home. But as I started living my life more independently, I started enjoying that sense of freedom and trying to figure stuff out on my own. And in the fifth, fourth and fifth year of my medical school, some of my friends or co-medical students were applying for electives in the US. So just because everybody was doing it, I did it too. Um, and then I was able to come and do an elective at the Louisiana State University Medical Center in Shreveport, Louisiana. And the first thing, the first difference I noticed as soon as I landed in the US was things are just on a large scale. I couldn't believe my eyes when I first landed in the US. And then I started to notice systemic changes. Like in India, uh, the, the, the pattern of medical education is very hierarchical. Uh, and somebody who is very average and was very timid, it was hard for me to ask questions. That's the subtle change I noticed when I was doing my elective in the US is that 
uh, when I did not know something, I would just guess in India. So when I did that in the US, my supervising attending was asked me, it's clear from me that you're guessing. Why are you guessing? I said, well, I should I don't know. That's how I've always been, you know, uh, brought up. He said, no, you can ask if you don't know something and we can discuss about that. And I was like, whoa, that you can do that. So that that was my first spark that I was like, OK, I want to train in this environment, because, again, I I'm not I was not and I am not theoretically an, an, an excellent board test taker or, any, or anything. I count myself as very average. So I need a learning environment where I can be average and it's okay to be average and ask questions. So that was the first thing that struck me. And then India gives you a lot of medical knowledge and work ethic and how to adapt and how to hustle. If you combine that with the facilities that are available in the US and the teaching that's available in the US, and the potential for research that's available in the US, you can really attain or maximize your potential. And that's why I decided yeah, after my two months worth of electives here, for, so first was at LSU in Shreveport, and then it was at Cooper Medical Hospital in Camden, New Jersey. Um, and those two months I lived in the US on my own, figured stuff out on my own, made so many mistakes on my own. And I just found that a sense of adventure, um, very appealing to sort of create a path for myself in this country because I don't have anybody here, but it felt good to make my own uh, path here. So combination of these things made me then want to take my USMLEs, you know, all the whole first aid and Kaplan and everybody's on this call has done that. Uh, and I did the same 10 years back. Yeah, just incredible. Uh, so Val, could you please ask the first, second question, sorry? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Adi, for, for your amazing insights. So we had to ask you, could you explore the difficulties you had to face as an international medical student to apply for, a, for and do a clerkship in the US? Sure, so firstly, internet was very different in 2011 than it is now. Um, it, 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 you had, a very few resources that you could rely on. And I relied heavily on the student doctor network uh, thing. The, the, it was the Reddit of that time, I guess, for medical students. Uh, and I used that to figure out as to where, first of all, I can even do an elective. I cold emailed, I applied to several, several places. So the challenge there was to concentrate on my medical school education when I was in India, and then in my free time apply for electives here. I did not know what I wanted to do there, so I applied very broadly. So first of all, I didn't have any guidance. So the challenge was I didn't know what I was doing in a way. Uh, second, some clerkships will take you, but they'll take you for $2,000 a month and $4,000 a month. And back then, $1 was about 60 Indian rupees. So if I'm asked to pay two thousand dollars, that's you know uh, uh, several thousand rupees in Indian currency. I did not have that, so I did not have the opportunity to apply broadly, and I did not apply to anything that would cost me money. So that narrowed my pool tremendously of the electives that I could apply to. Then once I got um, a reply from uh, places, the next challenge was the visa. Uh, I had applied for tourist visas to visit the US in 2002 and 2008. Both of them were rejected for whatever reason. Many people on this call may know have had the anonymity of standing in a line in the US consulate in your home country and nervous with beads of sweat coming down your forehead to go to the interview just so that you can visit this great country. Unfortunately, my visa was rejected twice. So. Uh, apparently there's some rule that if it's rejected three times, then you can't apply for a certain amount of time. So it was sort of a do I die for me. So once I did get elective acceptances at LSU and then Cooper University in New Jersey, I applied for the visa and it was, um, it was very scary and it was sort of a do, a, do or die uh, moment. Uh, but thankfully, my visa went through. But even that process is very anxiety inducing, very stressful, very expensive, and very do or die. And I don't think life as uh, early 20s should be do or die, but it was. So that felt very stressful, not just for me, but all my family who are in my corner. 
so that happened. Thankfully, that visa was um, accepted. Now, the next challenge was when I was at the Mumbai airport to come to the US, uh, my elective was starting on Monday and my flight was on a Friday. So when I was at the airport, the, per the lady at the airport counter looked at my passport and said that the passport number stamped in your visa is different than your actual passport number. Like my passport number ends with three one, but they had printed the visa as one three. So they said, you can't go. And I was, I was devastated. Again, I was alone at the airport, my first big international flight. I was already baseline stressed. And the lady said, you can't go. But uh, thankfully she said that, well, we'll just, you know, when, you, when they do your visa, they do your fingerprints, right? So she said, well, you can take a chance and see how it goes, but there's a chance that you may be sent back when you land in the US. So um, I said, okay. So that flight, I did not, uh, it was, there was a stopover in London and then I came to Dallas and then a small flight from Dallas to Shreveport. I did not eat anything on the flight because I was so nervous as to what's going to happen. And this was my first large, big international flight. But when I landed, um, they, they, the, the immigration officer here was fairly logical and he knew this was just a typing error and my fingerprints matched my visa. So they let me in. So these were the initial difficulties to get here. Then when I got here, my first day, I thought I need to do groceries. So again, this was not the time where you have Google Maps easily. This was 2011. Uh, so I, I charted my course to go to the grocery store. I entered the grocery store. And if anybody on here remembers their first time in a US grocery store, there's just so many things there. And I'm like, I want this, I want that, I want this, I want that. I had like eight bags of stuff. And then I went out of the grocery store and I forgot that I had walked two miles to get there because I didn't have a car. So I had to like walk on the freeway with my groceries for two miles to get home. And I just felt like, what am I, what am I doing? Like, I felt so silly at that point. So that was my first real like growth moment as to you have, when you're in the US as an immigrant in medicine, you have to plan. You have to plan for the worst case scenarios and you have to plan of what if this happens, what if that happens? Another funny story was my first weekend there, um, I went downstairs in the basement thing of my apartment to do my laundry. I put my clothes in there and I was like, where's the on button? And there was no on button. So I, I was like, how do I, and you know, in basement, there's like a line of people to do groceries, uh, laundry behind you. So to be quick. So I, I did not know how to do laundry. So I called one person who was my dad's friend's friend in some other state in the US. And I asked him, how do I do laundry? And he said, do you see four slots there? I said, yes, I do. He said, well, put four quarters there. And I said, what's a quarter? So he said, you know, the, 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 the coin, the 25 cent coin. So I put the four quarters and I was like, what do I do next? He said, push it in and out. So I pushed it in and out and boom, it started. So. Uh, that was that was that was interesting. Um, and then my first day in the hospital, I entered and I was like, "Wow, oh, this is so big." And then, you know, in India, when you, there's an exit sign in the hospital, you exit from one or at max two places. In the U.S., there's several exits to the hospital. So I entered the hospital through one entrance, and then I, at the end of my day, I followed the exit sign and came out of some back door exit at some sketchy behind the hospital area and I was like so scared. It was late in the evening and I was scared. So my point is that it's not just about applying to electives is challenging, everything is challenging in your initial few days. Uh, but you can go one or two ways after that. You can crumble under that stress or you can enjoy it. I think I first crumbled and then I started enjoying it. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, these were my challenges. It's not a, a just not. It's not just about getting here. When you get here, there was just man, so many things I struggled with. I lo got lost. I didn't know what the money system was. There was no Google Maps back then, so I had to chart my course, how to do groceries. Um, yeah, it was interesting. So these were my initial challenges to just get here and then survive here.
Yeah, um, reflecting on your answer, uh, I, I feel like many people here can um, resonate with that, especially when it comes to the prices of the clerkships, of internships. I guess 2000 uh, would be one of the cheapest, actually. I, I've seen 5000 even 20000 It's like such an expensive um like clerkship as well by to do, especially when you consider the currency that we have. For example, here in Brazil, um, one, one half, which is our currency, is like uh, at five. So you need like um, five highs to make one dollar, you know? Mm -hmm. It's basically the same in India, probably, like you told us. So very expensive if you consider the currency. Yeah, and right. I, when I was applying, it was 60 Indian rupees was one dollar. Oh my and God. Right, right now it's like 80. Now it's my 80. god, no, also India is much worse, yeah, than, yeah, oh my god. And their visa, and, and I know a lot of people out here are trying to get a visa to do like Sabai or any other things. And at least here in Brazil, the consulate was closed, um, in March of the last year and is opening just now in November. So, mm. so the queue to get a visa is huge here in Brazil, and I, I know that many people are struggling with that word that as well. So yeah. thank you for your honest. Uh, I think a lot of people can relate. Yeah, and we'll come. I think you send me your questions and the visa questions we'll talk about in the end. It's been a struggle. Every visa I've applied to, yeah. it's not been easy. It's not been easy. Um, but yeah, and then, and then after my first rotation at LSU, I then did a rotation at Camden in Co Cooper University Hospital, in New Jersey. And I had to take a small apartment in Philadelphia, then take the train from there to the train, sorry, a bus to the train station, and then train from Philly to New Jersey, and then walk over to the hospital. Um, back then, and even now, I think Camden is one of the most unsafe cities in the US, but the hospital yeah. was... The hospital was so good that I was, I didn't even feel that, man. I didn't even think about things like that. So I was just like so pumped and excited to do my rotation that uh, I worked so hard or not even worked hard, just got so plain lucky to get um, that I just, I just, uh, the adrenaline took me through those two months. And yeah, I don't know how I figured out the train system and the bus system in a big city. And that's where living in Mumbai helped me. And that's why if there's people on this call who have not gotten to their first choice places or whatever choice places that they wanted to, if I had done my medical school in my first choice location, which was my hometown, I would never have left. I would never have got the life skills to live alone like I did in Mumbai, big city. Uh, it's uh, Mumbai is just like New York City or Philadelphia or Chicago. So I got training on how to live or hustle in big cities because of my uh, medical school education in the in, in Mumbai, which I got in by default because I could not go to my first choice. So my point is things work out, guys. I mean, every disappointment is training you for the future. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I live at six months in Philadelphia doing research in a lab. And I remember sometimes, I will always remember uh, that my experiment finished very late, almost at midnight, and some guy is told me to ask for money, but I was like very naive, and I told him, I don't have money, and then he started following me in Philly oh. at night. Oh, God. <laughs> Unfortunately, nothing bad happened, but like I was, uh, and everybody told me, Philly is very dangerous, but again, I was so happy to do doing research at the University of Pennsylvania that nothing stopped me. I lost six kilos. <laughs> But I survived, and I am very happy with that. Um, you lost six kilos. I get, when I first entered the U.S. grocery stores, I discovered the joy of Ben and Jerry's. And every for those two months, every night I used to like eat from like those the pot things. And I actually gained weight when I went back to India. My parents are like, "What happened? You've only gone for two two months, and you you look so much heavier." So. Yeah. Uh, continuing to our next question, uh, during the match application, what were the biggest obstacles and which pieces of advice would you give to INGs to overcome them? Sure. So that's, again, a broad question. So instead of giving advice, I'm just going to tell what I did, and then people can take stuff from there. So I came to the U.S. for the second time in 2013 to give my Step 2 CS exam, and I picked uh, Chicago as an exam center. 
because my friend stayed only 10 minutes from the CS exam center. That was the only reason I picked Chicago. Um, I came here and because I was coming here in June, in April, I started cold emailing people all in and around big university hospitals in Chicago to see if I could get like a research assistant position. Um, and the way I would email is that your emails should be short. It, they should not be more than five to eight lines. And the subject of the email should be eye-catching as well. And unfortunately in academia, money is always a crunch. So I know we all want paid research positions, but I made it very clear that I will be fine to get an unpaid research position. And I made it clear, volunteer unpaid research assistant application. That was my subject line. So the, so, so the reader would be like free labor. Um, and that's when they would open the email. And then you would say, I am blah, da, 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 da. And I, oh, how I would do it is that I may have sent about 200 cold emails. And my rule of thumb is that if you send 100 cold emails, 90 of those are not even going to be opened. Maybe five or six may be opened. And then they will say that, no, we don't take international medical students or international medical graduates. Out of those four, two or three will be, you will start talking and then they will ghost you. And then maybe one or two will then maybe decide that you will, you may be called in for an interview to discuss that. So I got lucky and I, I emailed several people who, who, who piqued my interest of, I just wanted to learn how to do research. Uh, another Another mistake that many IMGs make is they apply to like research in like top things like cardiology, GI, you know, critical care, um, pulmonary critical care, and, you know, uh, uh, competitive stuff like that. I applied to general internal medicine or hospital medicine because I knew I wanted to do an internal medicine residency. So I applied to spots looking for just basic internal medicine, not, not basic science, but basic internal medicine research. And I made it clear that I would be volunteer, I would work for free, and I just want to learn how to do research and being as a part of their research uh, project would help me do that. So I may have sent about two, 300 emails like that to University of Illinois, University of Chicago, Northwestern, Loyola. Thankfully, Dr. David Meltzer from University of Chicago and Dr. Vineet Arora at University of Chicago replied to my email and called me in for an interview. And I went for that interview and, uh, you know, he was very upfront saying that, you know, I can't pay you because, you know, research funding is limited, but uh, you seem interested and would you want to work as a research assistant, on, not work, but volunteer, because my visa stipulation was I could only volunteer. Uh, so I volunteered as a research assistant on their project. Since I was there then, I told them that, you know, I'm not being paid but can you teach me how to do basic stats and stuff? So at the University of Chicago or any big university city, there are these four week, eight week, 12 week small courses that they do for the continued medical education of their internal staff. And Dr. Meltzer was so kind and he said, you should do that and I will waive your fees for that. You could audit that class. You can be part of it, but you can audit it. So I just sat in on that class and I gave all their tests. And for me, that was my biggest part of the day, right? For the other participants, it was one, there were fellows there, residents there, assistant professors, associate professors, people who just wanted to learn how to do basic stats. Uh, so for them, it was part of their day. Like they would see patients and come do that and stuff. For me, it was my biggest part of the day. So I got good at stats and I started I started helping other people with their homework and working with them to learn stats. That's how I got in touch with uh, Dr. Audrey Tanksley. These are people who, who are the reason why, why I'm here. Um, and she was a former chief resident at Advocate Christ Medical Center in Chicago. And she was then a fellow at University of Chicago in hospital medicine. And she was part of that program. So Dr. Audrey Tanksley, Dr. Nancy Stewart, Dr. Ayla Forku, and Dr. Scott, these were four people part of my study group. 
And then Dr. Tanksley said that, hey, Adi, you seem interested in medicine. You should apply to this residency program. I did not even, I did not even know that that residency program existed because I was not even applying at that point. So I applied then in July, August, September. Uh, September, I applied to that program. Um, that was one of the interviews I got for my residency because I am assuming she, she was kind enough to put in a nice word for me to that program. And then I interviewed there. They asked me about my time working with Dr. Tanksley and the University of Chicago. They liked me and they picked me for residency. So this is how it works. You know, you have to, you have to be grateful. You have to make the most of your opportunities. You don't, you should try and not be shy as as immigrants sometimes we are trained to be like don't ask just do what you're told and yes do that but also ask uh, do what you're told but also be okay with having a positive learning mentality and be okay to be told no if don't be shy to be told no to and don't take that to heart or to ego so if i had not emailed dr melser i would not have got to you chicago if I had not asked him if I could audit that summer program and outcomes research training, the stats thing, if I had not asked him to do that, I would. And also in my first, first day of that thing was on a Friday. And, you know, at least for me in India, you decide to go to medical school at a, you start medical school at 18, but you decide at 16. So I dropped math at 16. So I only knew math till age 16. So in the first day, I was so overwhelmed. I went and talked to Dr. David Meltzer and said, I can't do this stats program. I can't. He said, you know, don't say no right now. Sleep on it. See how it goes. I went home. I was again living in Chicago with a friend of friend who had never met. His name is Tanay Shah. He was, he, he, not, he now lives in New York. And he told me, look up this uh, website called Khan Academy. I know some people must have known that. They do some basic stats and math work. So I looked up Khan Academy, did some basic stats review all weekend. And then I, on Monday, I met Dr. Meltzer and said, okay, I think, I think I can try and do this. And I got really good at it. Because again, as I said, that was my only major part of my day was that stats thing. If I had not done that, I would not have met Dr. Tanksley and all my other friends there. I would not have been told about Advocate Christ Medical Center. I would not have applied there. I would not have got an interview there. So yeah, so that's what I did. So my point is that be okay to ask questions, be okay to be told no, uh, have a learning mentality, make contacts and talk to people and share with them your journey. Many people in the US don't know how difficult it is for IMGs. So tell them that, uh, but tell them that in a way that you retain your self-respect and not sell a soft story, you know? That's not what I'm telling. You should tell them the challenges that we have, but still have a learning mentality to it and do not waste or lose an opportunity. What's the most that Dr. Melser could have told me? No, you can't do that stats program. Okay, no harm, no foul. I would still be working as a volunteer research assistant there. So that's how things worked out for me. Um, I'm just incredibly lucky that things worked out. And then I went to Advocate Christ Medical Center for my residency, such a great place. And that set me up for my fellowship. Um, another reflection that I take from your answer is the fact that sometimes we feel so overwhelmed because as IMGs, we don't understand much of the how the US works. And um, if I think when you have this mentality of hard work and commitment and show how much you can contribute to certain space, uh, certain doors will open to you. I can tell that from my own uh, perspective and things work out. Still, it's still work out. We still have struggles, obstacles, right? But I think if we commit ourselves to do the best that we can, um, we can expect certain good things to happen to us. Yeah, so thank the, you. yeah, the US is people these days especially say a lot of like negative things about the United States. But in my opinion, it is still... And it has always been the land of opportunity. Like if you're good, if you're honest, if you work hard, have good intentions, then your path may be long or winding or have many obstacles, but you will still get where you're supposed to get. And that's why I love this country so much is that 
there's ways to get to your point. It may feel miserable when you're doing it, but looking back, things work out if you have the right intentions and are honest, not just to others, but yourself. That's important. Awesome. Um, so the next question would be, um, could you explore your journey in internal medicine residency? Was everything as you expected? And what were the biggest challenges? Everything was, you know, when I was uh, in medical school, I used to watch uh, House MD back in 2009, 2010, 2011. I was like, someday I may do that. And Dr. House, by the way, is ID and nephrology. So ID, let's go ID. Uh, anyways, uh, so I was like, oh, is that how the hospitals are going to be? And of course, that's not how hospitals are. But in the first two years, I was just so excited. My, the first two years of my residency, I was just super duper excited. And the adrenaline rush just took me through the first two years. And then third year, I was started applying for fellowships. However, Advocate Christ Medical Center is a large community hospital, which has an affiliation with University of Illinois, Chicago. Dr. Arman Krikorian is the program director there and Dr. Amar Chadaga was the associate program director there. Again, I would not be he here without them. In my first um, orientation session, I was looking around the room and I was like, what am I, what am I going to do here? I was scared. I was honestly just scared. And in my first week of uh, in, uh, medical floor rotations, I got feedback on how to change my notes. Because as you guys know, as IMGs, we do clinical care and then you start studying for your board. So there's sometimes a gap of like a few months or years till you actually see a patient. So, but thankfully I got into that groove very fast because I love seeing patients and I love making connections with patients. But the, I got feedback on how to change my notes and stuff. And I was pretty easy to adapt and the feedback was very supportive. Um, then during residency, the three years of residency were the best three years of my life. If you tell me today, go back and do residency, I would do it again, easy. Even if I would even take the pay cut because the, the relationships I made with, with my co-residents, in residency three years, you spend more time with your co-residents than you spend with yourself honestly, because you're always on call or some service or stuff. So I made lifelong connections in residency. I lived in, before my residency, I lived in the city of Chicago, like downtown. Then I moved to the Western suburbs closer to my hospital. I did not have a car for the first two years of my residency. Um, and the first two years that I lived in, uh, for, first one year that I lived downtown. And thinking back the Midwest winters, I don't know how I did it, but I used to wake up at like five and walk in the snow, go to the hospital. And now if you tell me to walk a mile and a half to go to the hospital, I'd be like, oh, how am I going to do that? But the adrenaline just got me through, man. And people always used to tell me, I used to sign up for extra shifts and I used to sign up for um, uh, more night call and this and that. And people always used to be like, why are you always so excited? And I told them that I'm so excited because I'm very lucky to have this opportunity. Not many people have this opportunity and I ended up here and I should be making full use of it. Um, I made such great friends in residency. So many firsts, like um, the first time I had sushi was in residency and my friend took me out for sushi and I was like Indian and I'm only Indian food and da, 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 da. And he said, eat this. And I'm like, is this like raw fish? He said, yeah, you should try it. It's really good. And I said, no, I'm not going to. He said, no, try it. And then I tried it. And the first time I had sushi, the first time I had so many different foods in Chicago. Chicago is a great city. Um, we used to have a monthly dinner club where, I used to, where we used to go to a restaurant. Seven of us had a dinner club. We used to go to a restaurant that none of us had been to. So that was good. I became a big baseball, baseball fan when I was in Chicago, a, a big Chicago Cubs fan. In 2016, when they won the World Series, I went to 24 games at Wrigley Field and they won all 24 games. Um, I, I have an interesting story. I was at Chest in LA and the Cubs were in the World Series. They were three, one down and it's a seven game series. So they had to win three in a row to win the World Series. And the, one of the first three in a row they had to win was in Chicago. So I actually pre pwned my flight and I asked my colleague to present for me a chest. I flew back to Chicago from LA, saw the game on my own, 
they won that game and then they won the two next games in Cleveland. Those like people have been born in Chicago, lived their life and died and have not seen the World Series. Chicago win the World Series because it was the first time in 107 years that they were winning the World Series. So that was a great moment for me. I'm still paying back the ticket of the World Series game, but it was worth it, man. I mean, so that was an interesting experience. My first real relationship was there. My first real heartbreak was there. Um, I call Chicago as my soul city in the US. I call Chicago my home in the US. So residency was a mix of friendship, new experiences, medical learning, and lifelong relationships and memories, which I would give anything to go back to. So I did not have one negative experience in Chicago. Yeah, I, to I totally relate to what you said about the, the notes that we as international medical graduates were not used to doing during rotations, right? When I'm scheduling my rotation, I'm trying to learn the SOAP method, something that we don't use here. So it's totally new for us. And another reflection for your answer is that I think the uh, baseball team should hire to watch the games. <laughs> well, it, it, should you hire you to watch the games. <laughs> there's, 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 there's hundreds and thousands of Cubs fans like me. It's a very well-supported team. Usually team which loses a lot has a lot of support. So that was me. But they won it that year, man. And I still have the ticket. I still have the picture from it. I went alone because nobody would pay that money to go with me for the World Series. So I, uh, I, I, I went and yeah, uh, people criticized me a lot then. But now I can say that I was there when they won their first World Series in 107 years. <laughs> Yeah, I think you brought them so much luck. They should hire you, Jack. <laughs> just to just to watch their games. I know. So please, Val, go next. Yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to say that I totally relate to the the waking up really early in the morning to go on rotations here in Peru. I I wake up like 4:30 a.m. to go to the hospital because it's quite far away. So, um, I I totally relate to that. And I wanted to ask you. I think the next question it's kind of a given for me because I as I, as I mentioned I love ID and I think it's hard when you live in a country like Peru that we have a lot of ID mm -hmm. cases every day. So, why did you become an ID doctor and what makes ID so special in your opinion? Uh, so that's a great question and. Thank you for being interested in ID. We need more people interested in ID. It's tra traditionally a field that has struggled to recruit because of low compensation. Um, however, during my residency, so my residency hospital was a large cardiac and ECMO hospital and a very high acuity hospital. We used to be the level one trauma center in the south side of Chicago and the only level one trauma center south side of Chicago. So all the stories you've heard about the south side of Chicago traumas, we used to get a lot of that. We used to get a lot of sick patients, a lot of unfortunately neglected population who used to come in with several comorbidities. A lot of patients in the ICU, um, many ICU beds, many step down beds. And the one thing I noticed was that every patient in the ICU for some reason was on vancomycin, And I was like, just, you know, why are they on antibiotics? Two of my very uh, influential ID mentors from my residency, Dr. Muhammad Tabriz and Dr. John and Rioni were the one who sparked the interest of ID in me. I wanted to do either critical care or ID. Uh, and they just encouraged me to ask the question for every patient as to why somebody is on antibiotics. And most of the times I would not get a convincing answer from the teams and the answers I would get is what many on, the, on this call who have done residency would be, oh, they're sick. Well, okay, but they're sick because they have heart failure. Why are they on Wank and Zosin adding so much salt and water volume to their heart? So I started asking those questions and I started noticing that a lot of critically ill patients, either on ECMO or in the ICU, all of them are on antibiotics for unclear reasons. And it became sort of my life motto to stop these antibiotics. Because once you're in the ICU or once you're in a critically ill uh, level setting, it's your, it, you, you are at a very high chance to be back in that ICU in, five, in six months to 12 months. So what you do in the present influences what the patient outcomes are going to be in the future, whether that be acquisition of MDR resistance mechanisms or C. diff or side effects or just adding to their overall morbidity. So that's why I got interested in antimicrobial stewardship. 
I also got interested in diagnostic stewardship because everybody had, uh, I always joke that everybody who comes to the hospital gets three things, uh, frequent uh, blood draws every two hours, lack of sleep and CT scans. So everybody gets CT scans. So I, I was like, why is this person getting a CT head? Why is this person getting a CT abdomen, pelvis or a CT chest? So diagnostics and then procalcitonin. Um, I have a big gripe with that. I spent two years of research in my residency to see if procalcitonin had any effect of antimicrobial use. People were starting to use it to start antibiotics when its purpose is to de-escalate antibiotics. So um, I started questioning as to why patients are getting bronx, why are they getting CT scans, why are they getting procalcitonins, why are they on antibiotics? And I love to do lines and procedures as well. So then I decided that I wanted to do ID critical care training. So I interviewed at, I think only a couple of programs gave that combined training back in 2016 when I was in 2017 when I was interviewing. One of those programs was at UPMC or University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. So actually my first choice for fellowship was going to be UPMC. But then I interviewed at Mayo Clinic and I met my eventual mentor and now friend, Dr. Jack Ohoro, and he also had similar interests like me. And he said that, well, if you want to do research in a diagnostic stewardship and antimicrobial stewardship setting in the critically ill, we have a large ICU here, we have a large ECMO patient population here, and we have the resources to let you do that research. So how about instead of doing one more year or two more years of critical care, you do two years of ID and then one year of ID critical care research. So the Mayo Clinic Fellowship is a three-year fellowship and that allowed me to do ID critical care research and antimicrobial stewardship and infection prevention and control training. So that's why I pick, I, I just change, you know, these pre, pre uh, fellowship or pre-residency dinners, they're very important. Uh, that's where I met my eventual mentor, Jack Ohoro, who then convinced me to come to Mayo, which I did, um, you know, as I, everybody on this call knows, as immigrants, you know, when we are in a home country, we hear big names, Mayo Clinic, Stanford, Cornell, and Mayo Clinic was that name for me. And I'm like, me, in, if you had told me in 2006, that in 2017, I would be training for fellowship at Mayo Clinic, no chance in hell, no chance. I do not think I would get there. But that opportunity presented itself. And I said, I'm coming here to train. And I came here to train and that's how it worked out. And that's how I did my ID fellowship here with interest in antimicrobial stewardship. I love to stop antibiotics if they're not needed. It takes a lot of gumption, I think, or heart to say that this is a non-infectious disease syndrome, observe off antibiotics. There's a common misconception that antibiotics, or yeah, that antibiotics are antipyretics or antibiotics will solve everything that's going on. Um, and it's my life passion to change that view of thinking. So that's for how I train, I, I work with fellows or train them to be stewards of antibiotics because what we do now is going to be seen in the future. We're already seeing so much multi-drug resistance. I've seen so much near you know, NDM bacterial drug resistance here. Uh, and this is something silent. And new antibiotics are not coming. There's not going to be an mRNA vaccine for antibiotic resistance in the future because bacteria are way more smarter than us. They've been here for millions of years before us, and they're going to be here for millions of years after we destroy this planet. But uh, we are, and that's why we have to be stewards of the few antibiotics we have, because the worst thing I want is somebody get pyelonephritis bacteremia for the first time in their life at age 50 and just because of acquisition from water or indiscriminate use in the past, it's a ESBL, E. coli type stuff. And then we can't use antibiotics for them because new antibiotics are not coming. They are not coming at least for now. Um, if things hit the fan, then maybe more research will be done on there. But for now it's, it's, it's about preserving what we have. And that's my long winded, passionate rant, probably boring rant for antibiotic stewardship. <laughs> Not boring at all, doctor. Uh, oh, oh no, you give, you give such an essential work, I think, uh, as a way to prevent atrogenic measures for the patients as well. And mm -hmm. thank you for doing that. Um, and I'm sure that through your answer, many more ideal lovers will come to the field. I hope so. Uh, in your Twitter, you explore many difficulties I and you face, like getting a visa. Could you mm -hmm. please talk about that experience? <sighs> Every visa has been hard. 
I think back and it just brings so many, so many stressful moments in my life. Like my visa was rejected in 2002. Me, my mom and my brother just wanted to visit the US and the visa officer at the consulate maybe was rude. And I have, as, as somebody who is a proud person that hurt me, then again in 28, 2008, thankfully I was able to come visit to do an elective here um, in 2011. Uh, so that happened. The toughest time from a visa standpoint, when I was volunteering at University of Chicago, I had to go back to India for some reason. And then I came back in November of 2013. This was the year I had applied for residency. Uh, and along with doing my volunteer work, I wanted to travel parts of the US to give my residency interviews, right? But I just wanted a small break because I was here since June 2013 to November 2013. So I went back for 15 days and I came back and I had to come back to Chicago, but I broke down the flight into uh, staying for a day in New York or New Jersey with my uncle and then taking the Chicago flight next day because I didn't want to do a Mumbai, London, London, New York, New York, Chicago, all back to back to back. So the person, the immigration officer, no, not the immigration officer, the, yeah, the customs, whatever officer who, who you know, gets you into the U.S., he asked, why are you here? I said, well, I, I'm volunteering at U Chicago, and these are my residency interviews I have to give. And he said, well, then why are you landing in New York? I said, well, I didn't want to fly back to back to back, so I'm living here for one day, and then I will go back uh, to Chicago tomorrow. He said, who are you going to live with? I said, well, just my uncle for one day in New Jersey. He's coming to pick me up. And he said, well, um, you're going to work illegally in New York City, right? I said, no, I, these are my residency interviews. I'm a medical student from India. I'm volunteering at U Chicago. He said, well, show me your wallet. So he went through my whole wallet and then he found the New York City Metro card. Because remember, I'd done my elective at Camden in 2011. And I just visited New York City and kept the Metro card in my wallet because I was never, I didn't know if I ever was going to have another chance to visit the US at that point. So I just kept it as a memento. He said, see, this is the Metro card. This means you're gonna work illegally in, the, in, in New York City. I said, no, sir, these are my, you know, I've just kept it. I was here in 2011 and you know how they do it. Click, 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 click on their computer when they're in front of you. And he said, oh yeah, you were here in 2011. I said, yes, that's what I'm saying. I have my interview at Advocate Christ Medical Center next month. And this is my interview you know, print out proof, what have you. Then he said that, okay, let me go through your phone. So he went through all my phone texts and contacts and he made, and all the, all the messages were, um, see you back in Chicago, good luck for your interview. So he went through my dad and then he went through my bag, make sure there was nothing there. Um, and I was, I was so scared. I thought I literally had like, you know, you see things in the movies and I was like, oh man, is this what's going to happen to me next? And then he went through my phone, my wallet, my stuff. And then he, he had satisfaction that, um, he could, that I was really going to give my residency interviews and that I was not a bad guy or I was not going to be an illegal immigrant. So he then let me go. And then I interviewed, uh, man, and so that was tough. And then I interviewed, thankfully, I matched at Advocate Quest Medical Center. Then I went back to India. And then I applied for the J visa in India, the J-1 visa, which is the exchange visa. For um, Because I, at that point, I didn't know if I was going to keep staying in the US or come back to India. So I applied for an exchange visa. Even before that, another interesting story was that one of the programs I interviewed at offered me an H-1B visa. But they said that you have to be certified you have to have your USMLE step three passed before you get your H-1B visa. So that interview was in December. I think they made rank orders, et cetera, in February, March, and he gave me that deadline. So I said, okay, I'll do my step three. So I studied for like 10 days, did my step three. Unfortunately, the step three result was delayed. Uh, they have like, I don't know, six to eight weeks or something for result. It was delayed by a week. So that program could not make sure that I passed step three. So they didn't rank me. So I didn't get the H-1B visa. So I had to get the J-1 exchange visa. That was fairly straightforward in India because then they know immigration officers or consul officers in embassies know, okay, J visa, this person, this he or she's starting their residency journey. They've seen it a million times before. So that was easier. 
uh, to Dan to be doing. So I did three years on J visa in my residency and three years in my fellowship. And then as my fellowship ended, my fellowship was going to end in June of 2020. So at that point, my, my, my next move was, should I go back to India or do I want to continue doing research and you know, in academic medicine in the US? I had a lot of projects going on at Mayo Clinic for ECMO and on a microbial stewardship and COVID related work. So I decided that I think I should stick on for a little bit more. So then as many on this call may know, after the J visa, you have to do what's called as a J visa waiver, or you have to switch it to an O visa. So I applied at so many hospitals. I applied at a hospital in the South. I'm not gonna give names because um, I don't want to put any hospital in trouble, but I applied for hospitals down South on the East Coast, on the West Coast, big university hospitals. I got offers from seven, eight places. Firstly, I didn't apply to Mayo Clinic for a job because honestly, I thought I was not, I'm not good enough to be here and I did not think they would do my visa. So in my batch of five fellows, I was the only one who didn't apply to a job here in Mayo Clinic in Rochester. So I got many offers from many programs in the country. I signed a few, but things fell through because of immigration, et cetera, et cetera. Then the pandemic happened um, uh, in December of 2019. And my fellowship was going to end in June of 2020. So I had six months to figure that out as to where I was going to, what was going to be my next step. Thankfully, I my, my program asked me to interview here for, for a faculty job here at Mayo, which I interviewed. And then they were offering the O visa for me and another type of visa where I needed to you know, have certain amount of publications and citations, all of which I had, thankfully, because my mentor and me, mentor guided me so well during my fellowship that I could have publications. But for that visa to be active, I had to go back to India to stamp it in the pandemic. So my fellowship ended June and in July of, um, July of last year, I had to go to India in the middle of the pandemic to stamp um, stamp the visa. Um, and I went there, it was hard, right? Because yeah, people may remember there were so many visa bans going on at that point. Um, and the political situation was very unstable at that point. Even, yeah, so I went to India and thankfully, I took a flight from Minneapolis to Denver, Denver to San Francisco. I stayed overnight in San Fran, then took a direct flight from San Francisco to New Delhi. It was like a 16 hour flight Remember, this was in July last year, so there was no in-flight service or anything like that. So they gave you this like small package with like two small bottles of water, two bags of chips and two bags of cookies and some old rusty banana that you have to carry for the full flight. So I landed in India, did my quarantine there. Thankfully, I got an appointment um, in the consulate there and they were able to uh, process my visa. Very thankful for the visa officers there who allowed me to get my visa stamped so I could come to the U.S. and do work. And I came to the U.S., started my faculty position here um, in early August of last year. And my first rotation was on COVID. Um, and um, it, it just feels like the last year has just flown by. I still feel I'm in August of 2020 because it, I've not had time to like sit back and think of this. So that's why I appreciate this call because it's making me reflect on a lot of things that I'm not reflected uh, and process. I still not processed it. So so yeah, those are all those have been my visa challenges. Every step has been very difficult and very tricky. And because of this, at least me personally as an immigrant, over the last eight years, I've gotten into this mentality of everything being do or die, you know black or white, this or that, if this or you're going back, this or you're going back. And that mentality has just stuck and now become sort of my personality. So I've become like a baseline anxious and a stressed person. And it's very hard to kick that mentality off now that I've gone through these steps. So uh, my advice would be keep perspective, guys. Don't make everything about life and death. You know, there's always other options if something does not work out. But yeah, so these have been my visa challenges. And now more challenges are coming and they're going to keep coming from a, in a, from a visa standpoint. If I want to continue doing my research, I have to be very productive academically. Thankfully, I have awesome colleagues, fellows, residents, mentors to be that. 
uh, but now I'm just sort of taking a step back and letting this play its course because I cannot control things that I cannot control. And immigration is one of those. So those have been some of my visa challenges. It's been, it's been, it's been tough, but very fruitful along with that. Oh, incredible. Um, this, this will be my first time getting the visa and this is a very reassuring answer in some aspects, like um, believing in the process, right? And just to sum up, I don't know if many people are familiar, but as IMGs, we can um, work in the US as residents through two types of visas, H-1B or J-1, like AD uh, said. But to get the H-1B visa, you have to have the step three. And then it's harder to get as because it's sponsored by the, the hospital. And also uh, it's easier to get the green card after that. And the J-1 visa is actually sponsored by the ECFMG, but you have to take a moment to work in other service to area, uh, what he called like the waiver, right, Dr. Adi? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, do you want to add something like a nuance? Uh, no, after, if you finish your J1 and then if you want to get uh, a job or a clinical job, faculty job, then you'll have to do a waiver or there's other avenues to have some special visas. But for that, you need a lot of academic work and publications and academic support, legal support. And I'm so thankful for my organization and for my mentors to do that for me. But, but the, the point is, everybody has a journey. So whatever visa you get, just take a step back and let the process play out. Again, if you're honest to yourself and have good intentions and have good people in your corner, it will work out in time. And make the most of it, right? <laughs> yeah, you never know, man. I mean, I was this close to being kicked out, like literally very close last year because my visa was the only visa that was not banned at that point. So things happen. So make the most, make the most, absolutely. So uh, moving on to the next question, I think this is very related to what we're discussing now. Um, what do IMGs bring to the US healthcare workforce and how we can make sure we support them during this process? IMGs bring tenacity, uh, adaptability and work ethic and just a sense of gratitude for being here. IMGs value what they get. Um, I'm not saying others don't, I'm not saying that, but we just feel very grateful for where we are at. And that's why most IMGs make, uh, are extremely hardworking and make the most of the opportunities that they get. Secondly, a lot of rural America is struggling and not having adequate workforce. Now, especially in the pandemic, we've had so many retirements and so many people who are leaving the field, whether that be nursing or um, uh, advanced practice providers like nurse practitioners, physician assistants, MD, so many people are leaving the field for burnout or whatever other reasons that a, a lot of us are going to have to fill in those slots as well. 29 to 30% of the workforce in the US is IMGs per, per the paper that Dr. Biren call and his colleagues wrote recently. And, um, Unfortunately, I, I do have a gripe that despite all that, I don't think there's a lot of political urgency to help healthcare workers who are immigrants to, um, to have a smoother process through this. And I'm not a politician, but I hope somebody does that. Uh, but in summary, I think we bring, the two biggest things we bring is tenacity and adaptability. Incredible. Um, so why don't you go next, Val? Yeah, sorry, I was muted. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for your insight, Dr. Adi. Um, we wanted to ask you um, that on your Twitter feed, you once mentioned two mistakes you made along the way. Neglected mental health, never celebrate the wins, and focus on things out of your control. Mm -hmm. Could you please elaborate on that? Yeah, so as I said in a couple of questions back, you know, I made everything a life or death decision or black or white or this or that. And I don't think that's a, that's a good way to think about things because that adds on stress, which you may not see when you're young. But then after the age of 30, you will have uh, rapidly thinning hair like I have. And uh, then a pandemic happens to add to that stress. So um, we are living life. So let's enjoy life, whether we are in the US or whether we are outside of the US. Let's not make things that 
my life is good only if I'm in the U.S. I don't think that's a way, that's a positive way to live life. And I think I think I made it like that for myself, especially last year with the pandemic. I was checking Twitter feeds of prominent politicians to see what visas are blocked or not every day last year when I was applying for my job. And that just made me very like jumpy and reactive. Like I would feel bad if some bad tweet came out by somebody or good if some supportive came, tweet came out. Then, and I don't think that's a good way to live your life minute by minute. So let's not make everything about life or death. Second is take care of yourself too. As I said, this, these things catch up. When you're young, you may not notice that, but stress catches up. Stress leads to a general level of inflammation in your body, as everybody on this call knows, and you are you will be at a higher risk for having cardiac issues and stuff when you're on the other side of 40 and 50. Uh, so let's try and take care of ourselves as well. Celebrate wins. Like what I did was that if something went right for me, I would always be like, all right, this is done. What's the next step? Instead of like sort of sitting back and uh, taking stuff in as to, okay, this good thing happened. Like Dr. Meltzer called me in for an interview. Awesome. Let's celebrate that for a day. But my thing was, okay, what is he, what questions is he going to ask me? How am I going to do the stats? Who am I going to live with? How am I going to network? Sure, do that, but find a balance, celebrate, and then start f figure out the time of your day, like an hour of your day where you're going to do nothing but worry about your stresses in life and plan stuff in one set hour of the day. And then worry as much as you want, cry, laugh, rant, get angry, da, 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 rant, tweet, et cetera. Uh, in that one hour of the day, do all, all that you want and then try and take the rest 23 hours for yourself because this is about you. This is, and this is about the patients at the end of the day. We are doing all this to help our patients. Remember that. And not focusing on things outside of your control is easier said than done, but try and do that. I've tried to do that. I'm still trying to do that. I still suck at doing that, but I'm still trying. But just being aware of that fact of that, okay, is, what, if, is me worrying about this right now going to change this? Just, just, just if you think about it like that, in a few months or years, you will learn about not, not taking this, these things to, to heart. And that's what I'm noticing. I'm getting better now at doing that. And I want to now, my, my goal is to not be a stressed out, anxious person all the time. Um, and I just being aware of your feelings of not focusing on things in your control, celebrating that good things that happen, however small that they may be, you got I don't know, you got an IRB accepted, celebrate that. You know, you, your soccer team won, celebrate that. Um, your, your soccer team didn't win, Think, pick a team in another sport which is winning and celebrate that. So, and then that's how you, you have, taking care of yourself and your mental health is practice, in my opinion. In the pandemic, things have just become so, everybody is like a baseline level of stress. Everything is frayed. Everything is like a live wire and it just needs like one small thing to set you off. Try and not do that. I'm trying to remain in a very stable sense mentally. Like if things are going well, I will celebrate it. But if things are not going well, I will try and stay in that zone of stability mentally, not take, not have too many ups and downs and ups and downs because that will get stressful over time. That's what I've noticed. And that's what I'm trying to practice. So sorry if this sounds like a, philosophical yoga guru answer, but uh, that's, what <laughs> that's, that, that's what I'm trying to do. Oh no, we love that yoga guru answer. Um, just reflecting on a little aspect of your answer, something that we were talking in the reading room, right? Like uh, Twitter can be such a great app, a great tool to learn, to interact with people from all around the world and have support. But sometimes Twitter can be very, um, like not good for your mental health so mm -hmm. make sure to toxic, toxic. address that it can be a toxic yeah. environment so, so i used to have a separate account uh, for following politics and sports and uh, i stopped doing that man because i can't vote and i don't play for my sports teams so what's the point in me worrying about those things right and with regards to twitter 
um, you must have noticed me. I People tell me, oh, you don't like wade into these controversies. And I'm like, yeah, why should I? I, ha I hold no stake in that. I want to take, my job is to take care of patients. And that's what I do. I use the mute button very liberally. I don't block people. I just mute so that I don't hear that. Um, we are, you always have to remember that, especially when you're trainees, you don't have your own, and even when you're attending, your insurance is given by your employer. So how you behave in some way does reflect your employer, whatever you say, even if it's a private account and you say, oh, tweets don't reflect this or that. So my advice would be like in anything in life is like I said in the previous answer, enjoy the good things that life has to offer and try not to be affected by the not so good things and try and stay away from that because as an ID doctor, I already have too much stress in my life right now, like taking care of COVID patients, investigating COVID outbreaks, investigating MDR outbreaks. Why would I want to wade into something that is going on with 20 people that I've never met, right? So think about it from a third person perspective. And that's why I don't take myself too seriously. And that's why I only make silly jokes. And as I told you before, before this call, my Twitter jokes are a projection of trying to get rid of my stress. And that's why I make silly jokes because life is short. We already have too much stress. Let's just take, let's just take a step back, not take yourself too seriously and laugh with each other. It sounds simplistic, but that's my Twitter advice. Uh, so last question. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, doctor. Uh, the last question will be, looking back on your journey, what piece of advice would you give to an ING that is just starting? Yeah, so be, know that you're doing this for your patients and to help patients and people who are sick to get better. There's patients in your home country and there's patients in the US. So if you cannot treat patients in the US, then treat patients in your home country. We are doing this to help sick people. That's point one. Point two is your journey is your journey. Don't compare yourself with others. Uh, that's like, you know, um, when, I, my, when I run for my fitness, I have to compete with my own self for my fitness and not Usain Bolt, right? Because I'm never going to reach there. So keep your journey as your journey and enjoy that journey. Keep in touch with people who help you through the way. A lot of times we ask for, a lot of IMGs ask for letters of recommendation one or two years after you round. With that said person, you know you're going to ask a letter of recommendation from them. So keep in touch even if you're not going to ask a letter of recommendation or every three months send an email or a text or a phone call to whoever has helped you through this journey and just be grateful for that. Keep in touch with your family or people who you care about. This journey can get very lonely, especially uh, with the pandemic. I, it's been so long since I visited home or saw my family. I had a family emergency last week and I felt horrible to be thousands of miles away and not be able to go. So keep in touch with your family. And if you get a chance to visit your home country, even if that is for two days and you have to fly four days to make those two days, do it because life is short and especially in the pandemic, who knows what's going to happen to people who, who you care about. Um, and remember, remember that this is a, a lot of IMGs get very objective about scores and number of interviews and number of publications. Again, take a step back. This is about helping patients. Don't be so objective. And lastly, don't take yourself too seriously. Just enjoy this process. As I said, I would do my residency again and even my research again because it was so, I felt like so much amount of personal growth during that time. So enjoy this growth. Um, in, in, in India, we say that focus on the journey and not on the result. If you focus on the journey and enjoy the journey, then the result will take care of itself in time. Um, again, I am not a spiritual yoga guru, but <laughs> these, these are some of the things that um, I think I should have done, and now I'm practicing to do in my life. 
Uh, actually, this is something that we say a lot in CP servers, like we should uh, be aware of the journey and of the final destination itself. Mm -hmm. So um, just thank you for sharing your incredible experience. I know for sure that a lot of people here in this call and people that are listening later on YouTube are going to resonate with you, uh, your experience, and not feel alone in this uh, tricky journey, right? Even though sometimes it's very difficult, so many obstacles, so many struggles, hearing from you and how you overcome it, all of that is just inspirational. But it's always. fun. It's fun. Like looking it, back, yes. it's fun. Mm -hmm. If it was easy, then it would be boring. Like anything in life, you know, relationships, work, journey, etc. If there's no challenges, it's not as fun. Yeah. But for sure. as I said, try and take care of yourself so you don't have hair thinning <laughs> and stuff in your 30s and 40s. Uh, any final reflections, Dr. Rade, before we finish this call? That's it. This is so great. I've seen the chat is like there's a lot of things on the chat, but mm -hmm. people can uh, my DMs are always open, but uh, uh, only for only for good vibes and not uh, not abuse uh, but if uh, people have questions they can reach out to me there I will try my best this has been so great again I've not reflect I've not talked about these things in my eight nine years in the U.S. and so thank you for allowing me that opportunity to process all these things it brings back a lot of good and not so good memories but it does make me feel very proud and very fr proud of myself for having been through it but more importantly, grateful to the patients who allowed me to do it. And so many people who've helped me through this. I would not be here because of all, without the names that I mentioned in this journey. And that's the biggest thing. Uh, there's be honest to yourself and you'll have people in your corner to help you. Um, just incredible. And just one final word, like you should be very proud of yourself in your journey. It's just incredible. So thank, thank you. everyone who enjoyed thank you. this today. And yeah, I hope to see everyone next to Saturday. Have a good All day. Right. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you.